wall running games. The classic video game concept, but if executed correctly, can be a real joy to play. In today's tutorial, I will be teaching you how to build an easy wall running game where you have to jump to different sides to dodge alternating spikes and go as high as you can up the tower. Let's get started. Start off by creating a new Scratch project and making two sprites called Player and Spikes. I'm going to start off by trying to code in our player first so that it's able to kind of move around between two walls. So go ahead and drag in your when green flag clicked block and make a new message called flag. This is just to give us a bit more control over the project because now we know which message triggers the entire code to start. As you can see, I've already dragged in my forever and repeat until loop, and right now we're going to make two new blocks called setup and player move. Once you're done, drag in the setup block right underneath the forever loop and put in player move inside the repeat until loop. So now we have this basic structure for when the game starts and when it's actually running. For now, we'll simply put in a go to x0, y0 block underneath setup so that our player repositions itself each time. And inside player move, I'm now going to do a bunch of calculations to tell the player where to go. So what I'm doing right now is I'm going to change x by direction minus x position divided by 3. And you can see that, that actually gives the player a bit of a glidey effect. And I'll break down this code a bit. So right now the player direction is 90. And when we do 90 minus x position, it basically tells us the distance from the current player x position to an x value of 90. And we can divide this by 2 so that each time we only move halfway. And that's what gives that smoothing effect. We're going to do a similar thing for y, but ex instead we're going to replace x position with y position, and we're also going to replace our direction with mouse y. So now our player is finding the distance towards mouse y and moving towards that. Now we're going to add in the mouse controls so that the player can actually flip to different sides every time we click. So I'm going to do if mouse down, then we're going to turn 180 degrees. And the reason why that will work is because we're currently changing our x by direction minus x position, right? So if I click, then the direction becomes negative 90. And right now it's actually not working that well because as I hold down the mouse button, it just keeps on turning, right? So we'll have to make a new variable called mouse down to check if the mouse is already clicked. And what we're going to do is that we're going to say if mouse down, then we're going to set this variable to one. And we're only going to, we're only going to allow the player to actually flip if mouse down equals to zero. Finally, we'll have to check if the mouse is not down, then we want to reset this variable. So I'm going to say if not mouse down, then set our variable to zero. And if we try it right now, yes, once I click, the player only flips once. And you know, if I click multiple times, it kind of follows my pattern. So that is a great leap forward. And we've basically already completed player movement. To make this a bit more realistic, let's actually create a new sprite called background. And what I'm going to do is that I'm basically going to draw two walls. So they're literally just going to be two white rectangles. And we're going to set um, the x and y position to zero. And you can see that our player is not quite touching it. And I'm just sort of adjusting it so that it looks like our player is kind of running along the wall. Once you're done repositioning it, simply copy paste that rectangle and move it over to the other side. So now it looks like our player is flipping between two walls. I think this is a really smart solution to getting easy player movement because oftentimes people might be thinking about, oh, how do I get collisions against these walls? Well, you don't need to because the player moves to those exact two distances and you can just put like, <laughs> you can just draw two rectangles, you know, side by side. So it creates that sort of illusion. Anyway, enough about that. Now let's actually start coding our spikes. So first off, I'm going to make a new global variable called tick. And this is just going to help us coordinate between our player and our spikes. Set our tick variable to zero in our setup block. And now inside our repeat until loop, we're going to drag in a new broadcast called tick and wait. Hop into your spike sprite. And in here, we're going to make two new variables called ID and wall x. 
make sure both of these variables are for this sprite only. Now, for the ID variable, this is important because we want to know which of the clones is the actual original when we start cloning the spikes. And the wall X variable is just for us to kind of know which X position the spike should go to once it's identified if it should be on the left side or on the right side. Now we're going to set our ID to org under flag, that's going to stand for original, and we're also going to set our wall X to 101, which I'm pretty sure is probably around the white rectangles that we drew, so the spikes would appear that they're kind of rolling down the walls. Now make a new message called clear, and we're going to say when I receive clear, delete this clone. So this will be useful when we, add, when we actually add in a death loop, so then the spikes delete themselves before the next game starts. Now, underneath our when I receive tick block, we're gonna drag in an if else loop and say if id equals the clone. Then we're gonna show the clone, and we're going to slowly change y by negative 5, so that the spikes are actually going down. Then we're going to check if our y position is less than, let's say, around negative 180, then we're going to delete the clone. So, you know, the clone has reached the bottom and we want to remove it. So now we don't actually have any clones, so the way we're going to do this is that we're going to check if the ID is not a clone, then we're going to assume it's the original sprite. So we're going to hide it, and we're going to add a condition to make it repeatedly clone itself based on our tick variable, which is currently zero. So quickly go back to your player sprite, and we're going to add in a change tick by one, right under player move. And you know, if we quickly test this and click on the green flag, we should be able to see tick increasing rapidly. And that's going to be really helpful because now we can use the mod operator or the modular arithmetic operator to check if tick mod 10 equals to one. If you're wondering what the mod operator actually does, it simply returns the remainder of tick divided by 10. So let's say tick is 10, then 10 divided by 10 would have a remainder of 0. But if tick was 1 or 11, then the remainder would be 1. So what the if condition is really doing right now is that it's saying every 10 ticks, it's going to make a clone. Because every 10 ticks, there's going to be 1 or 11. And when that happens, tick mod 10 will be equal to 1. So as you can see, I've quickly dragged in a go to x wall x y 1000 inside this if condition, and inside that I've dragged in another if condition which checks if our x position is greater than 0, so if it's on the right side, then we're going to point in direction negative 90, so pointing outwards. Else, so if we're pointing towards, well, if the spike is on the left, then we want to point inwards. So that's going to be pointing in direction of 90. Finally, after that, we're going to set our ID to clone, and that's where the magic happens, because when we create a clone of ourselves, now that clone will save its ID variable as clone. So it will be able to differentiate itself between clone and the original. So if you try out this script right now, you can see that the spikes have started to clone themselves, and they are removing themselves as well on the bottom or oh, they're actually not, so that's a really easy fix. Simply change negative 180 to negative 175, and now I believe the spikes should be deleting themselves when they reach the bottom, and they are. Now we're going to be refining our spikes. So firstly, we don't want it to only go down one wall, and the way we do that is we're going to, let's say, pick a random integer from 1 to 10, and if it equals to, let's say, 1, then we're going to flip our wall x. So then our spikes would go to the other side. In this case, I've chosen to pick from 1 to 15 because, because I think that probability is slightly better. And we're going to set our wall x to wall x times negative 1. Let's pop this right underneath our hide block inside our else condition. And now let's test this out. So hopefully the spikes should be alternating on both sides. And that really brings another level of excitement into this game. So, you know, we actually have to jump around now. And even though we can't die yet, very soon we will be programming that. But before we do that, I just want to make some very small changes to our spike code. Because I feel like right now, when the spikes change to another wall, they spawn a bit too closely to each other. And that's going to make the player's life really hard. 
So what we're going to do is that we're going to create a new variable called delay. And we're basically just going to slightly pause our cloning timer a bit when we switch to another wall. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to put in change delay by negative one right underneath everything else in our else section. And we're going to set our delay to pick random from 10 to 20 every time we flip to another wall. Now drag in a AND condition, and we're only going to clone if our delay is less than 1. So we're just going to combine those two statements, and that should do the trick. Oh, and let's add in a similar condition for when we actually switch between walls. So we're simply going to say if our delay is less than negative 15, and pick random from 1 to 15 equals to 1, then we're actually going to switch to a wall, because we don't only want like one spike appearing, and then the code switches back to another wall. So let's test this out, and yes, it is looking much better than before. There is like a clear gap every time we switch between the wall, so then, you know, the player has a much easier time avoiding the spikes. So now we have two main objectives left which are to add in the death loop as well as adding in a score. So if you're wondering why my spikes are suddenly sticking out so much more, it's because I have actually set our wall x variable to a smaller number, so then the spikes would appear a bit more. Um, just now the spikes look really small because um, they were actually hiding a bit behind the walls, but then since I've adjusted the value, now more of the spikes show up. So they are much bigger and deadlier. So, let's solve the death loop problem first. Now, because we've used a repeat until loop, it's really easy for us to add in a condition to say when the loop stops, and that's going to be when we touch the spikes. So I'm simply going to put that right into there, and then, you know, right now, our entire forever loop should restart when we touch a spike. But we also want to have a quick little death animation, so I have made a new block called death, and inside this block, we're going to drag in a repeat 3 loop, and we're basically just going to hide and show the player in a quick succession, so it looks like it's flashing. So we're going to do hide, and then we're going to say wait for 0 0.2, 0 0.25, maybe 0 0.1, <laughs> your own preference. In this case, I've done 0 0.2, and we're going to show and wait 0 0.2 seconds. Finally, at the end, make sure to hide our player sprite. So that's just a very quick death effect, and remember that we want to delete the spike clones when we restart the project, so remember to add in a broadcast clear and wait right at the top of our setup block. And remember to show our player. So let's test this out. I am moving on one side of the wall, and if I click to the other side, yes, we kind of blink and we die and the entire game restarts. Well, that is the death loop in a nutshell, and I believe now we should just finish adding a score, and that would be a good wrap up for this tutorial. So, make a new global variable called score, click on OK, and I don't know if you know, but you can actually change how the score looks like on screen by right clicking and selecting a large readout. So the number actually looks a bit bigger. And we're going to set our score to not, well, we don't have to make a separate variable because we already have tick. And tick could be like the amount of distance we've been climbing up the wall. So I'm gonna do join tick meters instead. And you can see right now, it's as if we're kind of climbing the wall and getting higher. So, you know, I think that's a good use of the tick variable as well. And I've just added a space um, right before meters so that, you know, the number and the word actually has some spacing in between. And I think that looks pretty good. Again, you know, the variables are not optimal for showing numbers and text. So if you want to add in your own text engine, which I've actually made a tutorial about, and if you've seen Griff Patch's recent video about making a score, you can easily implement that into this project. So that pretty much brings today's tutorial to an end. Um, I know it was probably a bit easier than most of my other tutorials, but it was still pretty fun bringing this simple concept um, for you guys to learn, and hopefully you've had fun as well experimenting on your own. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed, and stay tuned for more Scratch tutorials. Peace.